you know, this wouldn't be proof if we didn't also try to make pretzel croissants. Is this a first for the world, a pretzel sourdough croissant? The taste com that comes from this lye, it just makes me smile. Do we have co really cold water? Cold water? Co yeah, like colder than tap. Cold. Okay, so we have some colder than tap water. Ooh, it's cold water. And we also have some milk. And it's actually enough to use the water. You don't need any ice. Uh, crushed ice in the mix, but it, the ice will cool down the water down to okay. maybe 30, 35. So more or less this is low-fat milk that we're making right now. Just I have water. a little bit more butter in the recipe. So it's not so low-fat milk. No. We'll add the fat No, it should be... Milk. Actually, you want the fat part in the, in the dough. That's why you use milk, otherwise you could just use water. And that's why you use butter too. So now putting Harriet in with the, the liquid mixture. That's all set now. We could measure out the salt. And the flour. And the flour. I think something lighter like the type 70 would yeah. probably be. Yeah, definitely. Type 70 or rose or even the 00 will work. Let's, let's use the one that you most commonly use for your a country sourdough also, I think it makes sense. We use a type 85 for the country sourdough, but when we run out of type 85, we sometimes mix the type 70 yeah. with. A lighter flour definitely makes sense for this kind of product. 5,550, I'll definitely need almost three scoops. Probably should have had the next size up container. So if we don't spill any more, this right. is our flour measure. And this is also the recipe that I brought with me. So the Arizona climate and the Arizona grain probably will ask. For more water. For more water or milk anyway. Yeah. But the truth is this, uh, this dough should be very, very much on the opposite, opposite side of stretchy and fluid. It should almost be like resisting the shaping. Yeah, right, and that's, right. And that's what you want. So have salt, Harriet butter, flour, milk, water. All the ingredients are assembled, so as soon as we have a free mixer, we can throw them in the mixer. Actually, butter goes late Ooh, into the very mix. Very last, right? Yeah, yeah just Actually, like... after the dough has assembled, then you put in the butter. Yeah, la last, last. Like, that's how we do all the butter dough, so yeah. it's perfect. 300 on the dot. Perfect. Okay, so everything is ready for us to make pretzels. The fastest this can really go is we're going to take this through more of a sourdough process. So we're gonna bring the dough together like our country sourdough, we'll bulk ferment it. We're then going to shape the pretzels, let them retard overnight uh, in the cooler. Let them first proof a little bit, and then retard. First proof and yeah. then retard. Is that you want them at a stage where they're fully like ready to be baked. Shape them today and then we- Put them, put them on couches, cover and, them, and, and put them in the retarder. Got it. All right, so we're ready for this pretzel mix. We have the milk, water, and uh, Harriet in here. I'm gonna go ahead and go first, right? Yep. And this is quite cold, because uh, the water was actually mixed with ice. So I'm not gonna worry about butter yet. That's gonna be at the very end. Put the flour mixture in. And you actually can put the salt now. On top, okay. because it's not going to be in direct contact with the starter. Okay, so we're going to bring this together. I would say five minutes slow and five minutes fast. What would you call that um, cotton, cotton ball texture inside? But it's still nice to choose a lighter flour because uh, like a whole wheat flour wouldn't really have that cotton ball in right. it. Exactly. And you have the contrast of dark and light from the crust that is uh, built through the lye. You know, it's yeah. going to be very dark on the dark maroon brown side. It's a kind of a beautiful color, actually. It is, yeah. In some ways, I'm looking forward to the end result for, to see that color. And you said you like the slice. And again, you know, yeah. that builds the contrast yeah. between the maroon dark color and then the inside of the, of the bristle. You were saying that in Bavaria, there's no slide, no uh, scoring of the And pretzel. where in Germany is that? In Swabia. This Swabia. is the neighboring region to Bavaria. 
So they're competing who invented the pretzel, who has the best pretzel. And north of Germany traditionally didn't have pretzel at all. So can so it can be both. It would be maybe appropriate on our menu to call it the Swabian, Swabian pretzel. pretzel. Yes. It sounds very uh, exotic. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> S W A B I A N. So we're almost at the stage that all the raw flour is uh, incorporated, which means I can right. probably kick it up to second gear very soon. Yeah, exactly. I would not hurry. Like you can still leave it one or two minutes on slow. And there's really no dough on the proof menu that's uh, quite this stiff. No, nope. croissant dough has a stiffness for sure. No question. It, it has to because you put so much butter in it. So you're going to put the butter in now? Yeah. first. Slowly. That makes sense. Bit by bit. Yeah. Butter is actually acting as an emulsifier. Right. And it's cutting through the gluten strands, so it will never be that elastic. It won't have any air pockets, but you will have short gluten strands. And what I, what I understood is the, the English term shortbread comes from that. It has fats in the, in the dough, and it cuts the long gluten strands into shorter gluten strands. And that's why it's called shortbread. And actually, the contrast here is that we're mixing in the butter really just past the incorporation stage of the flour and the water. Uh, if you allow the dough to develop more on second speed and then add a butter, it has a different effect than if you add the butter at this stage, which does really prevent the gluten from coming together. Mm -hmm. But later on in the mix, the gluten could come together and the dough would be just almost lubricated by the butter. Yep. So what you're saying is we, we're we not aiming for like a strong gluten development at all. And we're kind of using butter in our as our friend to prevent just it. To help them, yeah. And that's also similar to other you know, baked goods like American pie dough, the same kind of deal you, or even biscuit dough, it, they both have butter, but in, in that case you try to create a marbleized effect with the butter, but for the same purpose of breaking up the gluten from really forming. Right. Because nobody wants a chewy pie. Uh, it's just not what you go for, for, no. for pie. Would you make pretzels with like a weaker protein flour, like a pastry flour, or would you still go for a, a better bread flour? Yeah, you still want to go for a better bread flour to create that airy cotton ball texture. Yeah. That is hard for a weak wheat flour to form. So it's, so it's kind of, of like a like a, yeah opposites that help the uh, the final product. So you want a strong bread flour with lots of protein. At the same time, you don't want the long gluten strands to form. And we're mixing it cold also to really prevent too much fermentation yeah. activity, it seems. Yeah, from the start, you don't want too much per uh, fermentation activity. And, and it's really like in these little things, if you think about it, that makes all the difference in the end. Because right. You will still make good pretzels if you do it a little different, but uh, you know, over time it has shown that this process works best. So the dough is pretty cohesive again with the butter. I think it's probably a good opportunity to go to second speed now. All right. So you have, you know, pretty decent development. It yeah. almost passes yeah. a window pane test. It's not too warm. It, it's also not cold anymore. We ended at 74 degrees. So it's still gonna be active during the bulk, but not, not like maximally active. So this can just go in a bin, right? Yeah, just weigh it in the bin. I greased it a little bit with canola oil. Just to prevent sticking. Just over 10 kilos of dough. So 10,080. And if we're aiming for 10,080. Great. And 34 grams each. It's gonna be a large pretzel, but nice. I'm excited about the large pretzel. I think it should be larger. Right. I just wanna knead it, just to get a good feel. It's always good to put your hands. Thank you. Okay. All right. Let's do it. This looks nice. Yeah. I think it's gonna be fun to shape with. Pretzel makers get to work with kind of a fun texture of dough. Are you going to cut it in strips to make it easy? Yeah. Left-handed. 
So we're dividing this in uh, pieces of 134 grams. So just because we weighed the dough before and it turns out 75 pretzels make exactly with exactly 134 grams. And I'm pre-rounding these. This kind of dough is almost relaxing to divide. Mm -hmm. Is that a decent pre-shape or do you think they should be yeah, longer? As long as, as far as it's like comfortable. Yeah. Okay. It's really important to not press on from here. And I think an impatient novice, you know, doesn't really understand this in their sort of relationship with dough. I'm more speaking from my, my maybe first experiences of making pretzels where I really didn't understand this resistance game. You, you need to do this and then take time because the dough really needs to relax if you're going to get that full shape. Otherwise, you're just going to go, you know, keep straining the dough to its breaking point and it's not going to do what you want it to do anyway. There's only so much elasticity uh, and extensibility. Those are kind of opposite polarities. Elasticity is that resistance and extensibility is, is what you're looking for. And there is an upper limit. The way in which you gain more extensibility also is just allowing the dough to relax. So I'm trying to find a good rhythm working with Satkaram in conjunction between his divisions, my rounding, and my pre-shaping in the cylinder. I'm gonna try 10 and then move on to this stage. Do you remember how they shaped these pizza balls? They took them like this and folded them into oh, yeah. itself. I remember that. And they make this like mozzarella kind of yeah. ball. Makes a very nice tight ball. It's amazing, 10 kilos of pretzel dough is actually quite a bit of pretzel. <laughs> I told you. <laughs> but then once you make it, you want to share. Yeah. So I need a few. Making our way through this batch of dough, the pre-shapes are building up. And the good thing is while you finish this kind of first pre-shaping, the other ones have relaxed to ready, a yeah. point where you can easily stretch them out. That's the problem with the small batch. Then you have a waiting time of 10 yeah. or 15 minutes, just doing nothing. Something I realized with all of the spaces we've had is how nice it is to be able to work across a bench from someone. Yeah something that I hope to restore in Mesa. It really takes something away when you can't work on two sides of a bench somehow. And something also helps to get your hands wet. Have you been surprised at how busy my current life is? Uh, no, but it was a surprise that it was happening in so many different places yeah. at the same time. YouTube doesn't really capture the reality of, of, of life. Uh, yeah, in between those spaces, yeah. Yeah, you see just, you know, kind of the focused part right. of it being in one place, but the way things all fit together. Even here, I didn't, I wasn't aware by watching the, the videos that this production part is, is a different building. Yeah. And you have to cross an 20, outside area, 20 yeah. yards or something like that to get to the other building. Also, a proof is a collection of, you know, 50 people working and a pretty large community of customers. It's a pretty satisfying product to make, actually. It's relaxing. It's like a meditation, right? Yeah. When I first started proof with when I was still working with Jared, we were making brioche rolls daily for one of the restaurants, like 40 of them a day. So I just got to practice a little bit each day. 40? Yeah. And it felt like a lot, right? It felt like a lot, yeah. <laughs> now we're making a baby batch of pretzels and it's tried quite a lot. So you're going even longer with the pre-shape than the ones I did. You can really lean into them. So what is the story of the soft pretzel and how it came to be made with lye in the first place? I mean, the, the stuff burns your skin when you use it. Right, uh, it will burn your and guts and throats. We're gonna bring the rubber gloves for this project. I think we even were talking about goggles. Right. How in the world did this come to be in a baked good? Well, there's several different 
takes on this and different stories, but I think the, the most agree, agreed upon is the apprentice was supposed to clean the baking sheets with the cleaning substance, and it was quite an aggressive lie to get all the, you know, the, the burnt parts off the sheets. And as a second job, he was supposed to dip the pretzels in the sugar solution. Because at the time, the baking goods that had that shape of a pretzel were always sweet, was always considered a sweet treat. Obviously, he made a mistake, and he dipped the pretzel dough, the shaped pretzels, into the lye instead of the sugar solution and, and baked it off. So the master comes back into the, into the bakery and shouts like, what did you do? Oh my God, <laughs> it looks so different. But nevertheless, they tried it, they put it in their mouths and they're like, hmm, that's quite tasty. <laughs> and from then on, they made it a product. Wow. <laughs> the funny thing is that this lye, which is quite aggressive and hazardous actually, loses all its uh, reactive faculties over a certain temperature. I think in Fahrenheit, it should be something like over 400 degrees or something like that. Yeah. So it's just on the surface of the vessel, and so it's immediately uh, touched by that heat, and it loses all aggressivity that it has otherwise, and becomes something quite enjoyable to eat. Would you say a bretzel isn't a bretzel without lye? Yeah, absolutely. Like many people try to get around this process because it is a little bit weird and strange to wear rubber gloves and protective goggles and all that and you know just imagine that you're putting something in your mouth that otherwise is a cleaning agent yeah <laughs> so they use baking soda many other things also but uh, it never gives you the same result it never gives you that kind of pleasant taste so these are our oldest ones i think we should put these aside because we need a certain length they, they should come yeah. almost to this length so these are the the youngest so to say so we should take them from here, Yeah, move them over there. So let's see your pretzel shaping. Now I feel it is sliding. So yeah. Just give a little space on the head. Very little is enough. We maybe even got to do the third stage. Yeah. They show some resistance. I see that. They pull together. But that's already an accomplishment, like halfway to the final size. So on this stage, I would, I would try to achieve an even thickness. And in the last stage, then we keep the, the center thicker and we roll out only the, the edges. That's a, that's a thing if you work on a stone bench, you don't have that problem with sliding dough. Oh yeah. It, it's just another surface to work on. Makes things easier in, in some ways. Probably don't have to wait a full 10 minutes between these stages, or do you think we still have to give it no, a... No, no. Just do a few of these, and then they will have relaxed enough. Also, there's a seam that you can still see. Yeah. But actually, it comes together in such a way that you don't have to worry too much about it, to have it on the, you know, on the bottom side or upper side. You won't really see it in the final bake. So what we're actually doing today is one of two most famous varieties of bretzel. This is going to be not the Bavarian bretzel, but the Swabian bretzel. It's a little bit different in recipe. Swabian bretzel has more fat content in the dough mm. than Bavarian. And also in appearance, it is going to be a little bit different. Uh, but we're going to go into this when we actually come into that final shape, I guess. What we can do, if you have some of these strings ready, uh, we can prepare some sheets with um, with kushes on, mm. because after we have shaped them, we should put them directly on the kush. Just prevent them from sticking while they're proofing, you know. So what we're aiming for is a, a thicker middle part. So probably you don't even want to touch that anymore. Yeah, the middle part. And then part. the outer part can actually be quite, uh, quite slim. And you leave these little, how would you call these, buttons, knobs, uh -huh. thicker ends. Maybe even longer. Okay, good. You want to stretch it a little bit? And then put it down and cross it. Cross it again. And then put them down here with their belly, with their buttons a little bit sticking over the edges. Nice. Yeah, yours is even nicer than mine. I think you can put them directly on the. On a kush. Right. They're very 
satisfying even to you see. You have to really put them, push them hard, so because otherwise they will actually come off, and then oh, you can see. still stretch them a little bit. Yeah. The final size. Gotcha. Okay. So they can even be a little bit longer because now they will prove they will actually rise and they will be very dense. And I think the the shape, the final shape that you also liked on the pictures that I showed you was the ones that were like large in size with big holes in between the different parts. Gotcha. So as long as I can make them. Yeah, probably from from the edge of the table to to this row. That sh that should be a good size. Mind you that they will still, from the elasticity, they will contract a little bit. Since this is proof, and since you work with Harriet only as your uh, fermentation agent, mm -hmm. this is also a sourdough pretzel, yeah. which is very unusual. And I'm really excited to, to get a taste of the result of this. Are you at all worried about fermentation time being different? Not, not fermentation time, but how, how the final outcome will be yeah. in regards of taste of the final product. That one did come can out. stretch them a little bit. So I think achieving something like this is probably close I to see. the optimum. <clears throat> they will have the same weight, you know, yeah. in the end it doesn't matter, but They'll it's just, just be like different shape. the pre preferences of have, having different, a different shape and uh, the size also of it. So the appearance matters. Are there rules in Germany about what you can eat a pretzel with? Not rules, but habits. Habits, say, yeah. and what are they? The mustard is definitely uh, something you can have it with, or in Bavaria, they would have a certain sausage called Weißwurst, which is a very special sausage. You're only supposed to eat it until noon. Now there's a couple other shapes that we were talking about. Are, are there any we can still make? Yeah, pretzel uh, sticks. So that's just that. They would be maybe a little bit longer. Okay. Like that. We should leave a few as pretzel okay. sticks for sure. And then there was the knots too, right? Yep. The one string knot. Actually we call it the one string braid. Because you braid it, but you only use one instead of three or five. Mm. Yeah. Getting there, huh? Gosh. I like to practice those techniques when you get a chance. It's like rolling the dough with two hands versus one. If you never practice two, then you'll always only be able to do one. Right. And this one in particular just looks so cool that it's hard to <laughs> can show off. Whenever you're practicing bread, don't just limit yourself to one loaf. At least make two because you'll get at least double the practice. But if you can make more than two, if you can practice at scale, it's a lot easier to learn anything. So, you know, practicing on 75 pretzels versus practicing on a batch of eight. Well, I can afford to sling, do some pretzel schlingen. Uh, <laughs> did I say that right? Yeah. We, we definitely did stages of stretching this dough out to get to this length. And that's also something I've never done before in making pretzels. I think it was a big mistake that we were making in the past that would have limited us from having such good pretzels. You can see as they're coming along versus our first trays, how much more consistent in size these last ones are. It just goes to show like what practice does. If we made these on a daily basis, probably all of them would look This more is or your less first day of practice. You already yeah. achieved like 100% improvement. <laughs> As you're improving in something, at first there's rapid gains, you know, it's every day you do something, you see it. But then things do stabilize eventually and you have to fight harder for those improvement gains. Right. And there's something nice about both ends of it. Uh, it is nice doing something new and feeling like, wow, getting better every time I try this. But also there's something about the slower growth that comes with a maturing in understanding. I feel like I'm getting it down. So after these are shaped, they're going to proof for a little while. And then uh, once we're done proofing them, we'll put them in the fridge. They're actually gonna develop a, a skin around the dough, which normally in almost any other bread would be undesirable. In this case, Satkaram says, the skin is what's important before interacting with the lye. And the reason being, you don't want the lye to go into the crumb of the of the pretzel, you want, you want it to stay on the outside. 
actually I thought about it more, if it's inside the crumb, it might not even get to that temperature that makes it inactive. Yeah. So it's like absolutely undesired to have it inside the crumb. That's why the skin is, is not just a nice extra, it's actually almost a mandatory treatment. And you can do it by um, having it proof overnight in the fridge. Or if you want, if you have less time, you can actually put it in the freezer for 15 minutes, 20 minutes. So the dough won't really freeze, but it will form that, that skin. There's a lot of little things that make a big difference. The wet hands, uh, the skin, the multiple stages of pre-shaping. All these things could really screw somebody up. Um, yeah. And the last time I tried making pretzels, we weren't very experienced, and I'm pretty sure I failed at all of those points. <laughs> uh, also, the dough is quite underdeveloped for when we're shaping it compared to almost anything else that we would do. Yeah. Um, and that's something worth thinking about too. I think I let the dough bulk ferment to a later stage, which did impact how easily this dough came together in these final shapes. So these are now gonna go in the proofer for a little while, then the walk-in overnight for baking tomorrow morning. So this has to be really dry. You don't want any water to be in there when this goes in the container. The rule of uh, dissolving lye is always have the water ready first and then dissolve the lye in the water. And don't like scale the, the, the lye and then put water on top of it. Yeah. Because that will be a, high, a super high concentration in the beginning. Ah. And then you have a super strong reaction. It can actually splash and you know, really react Mm. That's actually the common rule with any like acid or lye that you dissolve. So we have two different kinds of uh, food grade lye. This is the food grade lye that I have access to uh, in the United States. And this is Bretzel Lauge. Lauge. Bretzel Lauge. Lauge is lye. Yeah, so this is food grade lye. Ba it's basically, chemically it's the same. And uh, this is roughly exactly what we need, so I'm just going to use this one. So the concentration recommended for uh, pretzels is 4%, which in this case we had 6 liters of water, means 240 grams of the lye. So lye on the periodic table is NaOH. I think it's sodium hydroxide. I don't know the English maybe. term. Something like that. Yeah, sodium hydroxide. Yeah. It's right here. So this compound happens when you bring these two elements together. And Luis. it's the used in all kinds of things. Intense. Soap making, yeah. uh, cleaning mm. agents, treatment of water. This is food grade lye, so it's also used for food preparation. It's used sometimes to alter pH and metal dissolution. It's definitely a very powerful chemical. And so we, we have to take some precautions in handling it. I've only used lye a few times in making pretzel attempts over the years, but when we were discussing your, uh, your vacation here, uh, quite some time ago, we thought, you know, this would be a great thing to make together. Right. Uh, soft German pretzels. And, and it is really fascinating to work on this because this whole process has been a bunch of little things. If you do wrong, you get a, a actually you could even say disastrous result, especially when dealing with something as sensitive as this. There, there is a reason to be cautious around making pretzels the traditional way. Uh, and I don't blame people for not wanting to use this chemical compound, but to make an authentic pretzel, this is what we're what yeah. we're dealing with. So go slow, and I'll start dissolving, and make sure that you're not bending over because there's going to be a reaction. There's going to be uh, fumes coming up from this, so you don't want to directly inhale those. Also, it is helpful not to splash, you know, because you don't want any splashes on your clothes or on the bench. We're using, you said, four percent. Yeah, this is 4%. Uh, a lot of times... As a substitute, baking soda. It, it's, it's less harmful, like it's actually very harmless, but it also doesn't give you the same result. 
So it forms a little bit like crystals now in, in the water first. <clears throat> That's why I took the whisk to dissolve it even a little bit physically. But it, it's quick, it just takes a minute or two. It's also a little bit blurry, the water right now, but it will be, become clear. And that's a sign that, that all the crystals have dissolved. It'll warm up the water a little bit. You can actually feel it. It was, it was cold water from the tap, and now it's a little bit like lukewarm. But that's only during the initial uh, reaction of dissolving. It will co cool down again to ambient temperature. It's already becoming more clear now, the water. I do have bigger gloves here. The question is how well can you handle, like hold the, the pretzels when you dip them? Yeah. Do you have a good feeling in your fingers still? I think this? it's okay. Okay, good. So here, like look, look at this. This is actually a part that hasn't dissolved yet. Wow. So it, yeah, and it's also very warm when I touch it. So if I would touch this with my fingers now, You'd super high burned. concentrated, yeah. I would burn my fingers. I would burn my skin. Uh, you can store it in a container with a lid that closes it tight. And the rule of thumb is you can store it four to six weeks without any harm. But because you dip organic material into it, like after a while, it just needs to be renewed and recycled. And since it's a, a soapy lye, you can actually just spill it in the sink, you know, and rinse it with, with more water to dissolve it even more. It actually cleans your pipes. The big challenge we're facing in this first attempt at making pretzels is getting the proofing right. The sourdough pretzel is, again, a unique thing to proof. And sourdough fermentation, as we know, is very different than yeasted fermentation. So have to challenge some assumptions of the process leading up until now if we don't get the results we want. Uh, but generally, with pretzels, it sounds like from everything that we've been talking about that we don't push them nearly as far as some of the other products in the fermentation uh, and leave more for the oven to do. Yet, if you don't push them far enough, they really won't get a whole lot of uh, oven spring in the first place. So right now the challenge is to figure out whether we've reached a sufficient enough level. Our goal is to fire off a very small amount, just one deck, uh, and see how it goes, and then gauge it from there. That's part of the point of testing. We should get it right today. So we just pulled these out of the proofer for a little bit to try to give them uh, more activity. Uh, and now it's important to just develop a small skin around them uh, before baking. So we're going to shock them in the freezer for just a moment. It's something that we don't do very often. They're a little bit shiny surface. You don't want that. In a perfect world, we would have found the right range from which just to pull them from the refrigerator and bake them. And then you avoid this process. But we're watching the dough, and this is a test. And so it's, it makes sense that we would you know, have to test it out. And I'll set the timer for five minutes. You got it? Yeah. You can take the salt if you want. Yep. So we got some protective glasses, goggles, and uh, proper gloves to handle the, the pretzels while we dip them in the lye. How do they look? Yeah, I mean, it has a little skin. I think. Okay. Yeah. They look dry now. Yeah. Seems like a great time to use this, where I'm going to dispose of the blade, the stick, is worthless to me as well. You can dispose of it. I have a lot of them. Just to display safety. Yeah. I mean, truly, if you dip the pretzel and it splashes in your eyes, it could be a bad situation. Yeah. So. I could drop them by accident. You could drop them by accident. It's not worth taking a risk, which is unnecessary. So this is just because these break very easily, and you don't want to take a risk while you have your hands in the light, and these break. Yeah. So you can just put them on my hands oh, yeah. gently. Right. I try to keep my hands mostly above this bin, so whatever is falling off from my gloves. So we say two to three seconds in the lie, so now I have three, I can handle those. As you can see, I'm trying to hold down these little belly buttons to the dough so they don't fall off. Okay, we can do the next three. 
And I think you can put this in a speed rack and we go to the next one. Just try the parchment paper without oiling it Yep. for now. And then here I'm going to score these and I can put salt on them, right? right. Which I think I left in the back. So I'm scoring the belly of the pretzels. This is apparently only a feature of Swabian pretzels and not the Bavarian uh, pretzels. There's two regions of Germany that compete for notoriety on soft pretzels. But I really much prefer the overall dynamics of the Swabian pretzel, including the score. I think it's a really nice contrast. It can be quite generous. Because it's easy to flake off right. if somebody doesn't like all the salt. So these are very transparent crystals even. So the traditional pretzel salt is quite white. So I it creates a contrast with the browning uh -huh. of, the, of the pretzels. So I should find a really white salt. If you can. If not, I can send it to you. All right, let's Take see it. how this goes. So yeah. I think we should slide these directly on the deck now. And no steam required? No steam, and how much time do you think? Let's go with 15 minutes first. 15, all right. Yeah. We have a light in this deck. It's going to be interesting to see how these guys transform yeah. in the next 15 minutes. You still want to keep the light, it's the humidity. You still want to trap that now in the, in the I oven. I see. So should I close the damper then? Yeah, definitely. OK. But you don't extra steam it, because that will wash off part of the lye. And of course, you don't want that. Okay, so we're just taking a peek after about five minutes of the bake just to see what happened here. Uh oh, nice. The browning is happening. The browning's happening, although not a whole lot of. Uh, there is some, some rising also. Is that about the size you think? They might rise some more. Okay. Yeah. Should rise some more, definitely. But it's I only five minutes in, and with bread, you say the first almost 10 minutes, there's a raise. Yeah. I have a feeling that the second batch is going to get more rise. We were a little bit impatient. <laughs> The thing about the sourdough process is it is fundamentally different than a yeasted process through and through. And, and that's actually why there isn't a whole lot of sourdough bakeries to begin with, because all of the baker's knowledge of the world right now, for the most part at a commercial level, centers around using yeast in a recipe. So if we talk about sourdough croissants, you, you have to start over. You have to start your whole paradigm over, because something that takes a couple hours to proof might take four times as long with a sourdough starter. Uh, but that changes the way that the lamination goes. That changes the way that the butter is handled, the dough temperature is handled. And I imagine with pretzels, we might be facing similar obstacles. Right. And we have to still hit the critical note. So what I'm very happy about is that in making pretzels with you, now I understand some of the nuances and things I'm looking for. but. Who knows, maybe by the end of the day we'll have to still investigate how this all fits in a sourdough process a little bit better. Uh, and maybe because we've spread out our opportunity with the, the pretzels we have, we can find just right. One thing that concerns me at this stage is that we did a quite short bulk, bulk time. Yeah. And what I've noticed in my own experience with all the other products is that if the bulk fermentation is cut to a minimum before the dough is refrigerated, then it seems like you never quite get the full okay. rise at the end. Then again, finding just enough and understanding that pretzels are not supposed to have as much of a fermentation cycle as the rest. But what does that mean in a sourdough process? Does that mean shave off half in the beginning? Does it mean shave off a quarter in the beginning? Right. These are little nuances that can't really be teased out without trial and error. Right. And uh, there's also a difference in the size of each pretzel in comparison to a bread. So that means you have 100 and 
120, 130 grams piece and you handle it with your hands, they get quite warm in the process. It takes some time to, to actually divide them and shape them, right? I think we used about an hour yesterday yeah, yeah. with the dough on the table, having our hands on the dough. So th there's also a difference there, which can speed up the process. Well, we definitely had 70 something degree dough for roughly four hours yesterday. But compare that to our normal average where we have like 85 degree dough for four hours or so. But did you check the dough temperature at the end after we handled it? And I the, didn't check probably it, at it the was, end. Yeah. You think I it was would, I would suggest it probably was over 80. So it's actually, we've, we've been chatting for another four minutes. Uh -huh. And it is true, They're we getting are getting there. a nice rise. See how the white center is coming up, is yep. popping over the, the edges there? And maybe it's just right, to be honest, because... I need some more time. I, it, I, what I mean is, like, maybe the rise isn't as bad as I Right, uh, it's definitely suspecting. not bad. It's maybe not at the peak, but it's not bad. That's for sure. No open crumb structure necessary here, right? No. So we didn't have enough silt pads. Typically, this is the best way to go with pretzel baking, without a doubt. You can see that I can actually peel this right off the silt pad. I try to do that here, and the entire parchment paper goes. We should have at least oiled the parchment paper. We didn't. So those two are going to be a big problem. And I'd love to say that I did this just for you all, so that you can see, so you can avoid this issue at home. And fortunately, like the worst case scenario is we sacrifice two pretzels at the moment. But you really want to invest in silt pads. Sadly for us, all of our silt pads are at a different bakery today, and I thought they would be here. Uh, so we found one suitable silt pad. Not good enough in this case. The level of darkness. Yeah, these are not fully, maybe a minute, two more. It's actually a, like a dark brown maroon color that you're looking for. So my estimation was tw it was 18 minutes. We set the timer on 15. We have two minutes to go. So probably 18 will be just right. And the temperature is a little bit lower than, than the setting. So yeah, it makes sense. All right. We've got little uh, dark buttons. Is yeah, that OK? That's fine. Spritz them with a little bit of water. They're still very hot. To give them a shiny appearance and to help the, the crust uh, close more so the moisture stays in the in the crumb But will these actually be edible pretzels with this paper situation or will these be sacrificial pretzels? Uh, I'm worried that it's gonna be the latter with these two unfortunately. I don't see how we're gonna get this paper off These on the other hand are not gonna be an issue So if you don't spray these with water after the oven, they just won't have the shine and they the Overall texture of the outer crust will be affected in a minimal way. Some people might even say they will last a little less long. Because uh, the, the, when you spray a loaf or brush a loaf with moisture afterwards, it's like to create a seal on the outside. And that's something that won't happen without the water. So that's why we do it. And it is a helpful, helpful trick. So you can see on the silk pats, these pretzels just peel right off. But uh, that's not the case with the with the ones with the paper, which I think are just uh, probably going to be sacrifices at the moment. I think I would be a fool not to sell something like looking this good uh, that probably won't be very edible by tomorrow because pretzels are really the best same day. We have 75 of them. I'm obviously going to have to do something with them. It's not a small batch, but it's one of the smallest mixers we have. Uh, we only have one mixer smaller than that, and uh, we wanted to do something that approximated a real test for something we would actually do in the bakery. And so I will definitely sell these once I'm happy with the, the overall taste myself. You still get the taste of it, but mm -hmm. the dough is not fully proof. Are you upset with the texture of the dough? or Not totally upset, but yeah, it definitely needs more proof. So round think? two will be better, huh? Right. Yeah, you can see it. You can see the general feel of it is okay, mm -hmm. but it's just not light enough. Meaning it's too translucent no. at this stage. A common misnomer, I think, amongst newer bakers is misjudging a lack of fermentation with underbaked product. 
So if you look closely on the inside of this this crumb, which clearly needs more fermentation time, we've we've decided there's a translucent quality to it. It it has the appearance of raw dough. It's actually just I think really really dense dough. Yeah. Uh, that's it's not raw. It's more like the <clears throat> scallop. Right. Like that's not raw either. That's a cooked product. It's gelatinized, which the same thing happens in bread baking. The the actual crumb gelatinizes over time. So this is a gelatinized bread crumb, but that translucence tells you something. It tells you that there is a lot of room for expansion still left. All the energy is still stored inside. The same is true of croissants. If you don't proof a croissant long enough, then you have the same quality in the crumb. You don't get an open honeycomb, you get a dense thing that looks more like butter, like melted butter. Bread also, it, you get a denser crumb, uh, more translucent. So the point I'm trying to make is it's important not to misjudge that because baking this longer does not improve the result. It's a fermentation issue uh, and we need to be pushing the pretzels we have in the proofer longer then reevaluating them. Would I still eat this pretzel? Absolutely. Probably, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll give it to probably the team to enjoy, but I think round two will be better. Right. Um, so next batch of pretzels, are we gonna blast freeze them for a moment? Yeah, right. I think, should we take two trays now? We should probably also do these croissants. Yeah, we can do those right away. So maybe take one tray. Yeah, okay. The one that you feel most developed, but they're probably all the same. I mean, it certainly feels better than this morning's and the two croissants. These I think we're still gonna have to bake in the rack oven though. So we'll use a silk pad. Yeah, one of the small ones. Five minutes in the freezer. Okay, one for you, one for Pete. You like it? Yeah. It's, uh, according to Satkaram, acceptable at a bad place. It is, in fact. Uh, if you were in dire need of a pretzel, you would probably eat this. <laughs> <laughs> it still has a lot of growth to do. Oh, so, well and it's because we haven't really found the right range mm -hmm. yet. We so. tried to translate this from a yeasted dough into a sourdough proofed dough, and that's the first trial that we do. And the thing is, everything we do proofs forever and ever and ever and ever, uh, and we're just starting to discover how long forever and ever means for a pretzel. But give half this to Pete. Thank you. Uh, this will probably have to remain part of the process my final flow will probably be shape, proof, right. refrigerate. Right. And that proof might be... And we didn't even proof at all. Right. We just had them right from the shaping directly to the fridge. Yeah. So now we're paying for it today. Okay. Um, that's okay. It just we have to find the right timing today. Right. I don't know what texture I'm looking for like you do. And so I, I yeah, it's feel still, a little It still seems here. it hasn't proofed. It's warming now, but it's not really proofing. Still, after one and a half hours before we pulled the first yeah. ones. Uh, after we pulled the first ones. So, yeah, it's just, everything just takes longer. Yeah. I mean, you want to see a volumetric change right. in the... A pretzels. doubling. Yeah. A doubling would be probably the right amount. And the first ones grew 20%. I'm starting to suspect that we're going to have to come back this afternoon. <laughs> and do the last ones. <laughs> it, seriously, though, like everything we proof so far, anything that's enriched, proofs like six plus hours. You know, brioche proofs forever. Mm -hmm. The sourdough croissants in the very beginning, the original founder of proof was missing like five hours of proofing. And the thing is, it's in our name. It's like, <laughs> the thing we you do is proof. You can't complain, it's already in the name. <laughs> <laughs> it even rhymes. <laughs> okay, these are ready to go. So we do these first. Let's do them. These are very delicate. Yeah. You know, this wouldn't be proof if we didn't also try to make pretzel croissants. This is a fully proofed croissant. This is kind of a crazy thing that I'm doing to it because usually by this point, handling a croissant at this level of uh, proofing is just a very delicate process. We are going to bake them in our small rack oven here. So the lye is taking place of egg wash, in this case. You don't salt them. You want to keep the option to eat them with the sweet filling or with the savory filling. So that's why you don't salt these. 
no steam either, so we're just going to set right. about 15 minutes, no steam. We'll close the damper, we'll let the lye do its thing, and I'll even crank it up a little. Wow, I'm very excited about this. Uh, that was a good idea to try this. If you're making the effort of doing pretzels and you already have the lye bath around, I, it kind of makes sense to get a right. two for one. Oh, this was an early shaping experience. I can tell yep, by right by the small ones. So why you only keep them for like a few seconds in here is you only want the the coating of the of the lye, and you don't want it to permeate into the the actual dough. For me, it still definitely feels like underdeveloped, but yeah, probably. But it should definitely be more developed like the, than yeah. the last ones. It'll be very interesting to see the comparison. Ready? Ready. Wow. <laughs> How long did we have it? Eight, 17, 18 minutes? Yeah. 17. So 17, I start with 17. Yeah. That's 17. already oil, so we can use oh, that. Oh, that's oil, okay. Yeah for the next batch. You can put your glasses on top so we never open this lid without the glasses on. Oh, that's a good idea. It's a good habit. And before I take my gloves off that I had in the lye, I washed my hands with the gloves on so, you know, the gloves are not harmful. How does it look like? Almost too much color for this stage in the bake. Well, this is, this is due to the lye. They, they're gonna yeah. come out really maroon, dark brown. Yeah, it's five minutes in now. Give it more time. Yeah. Puffing Slightly up, larger. Puffing up a little bit. Because they look about the same size as our final product right now. Yeah. Five minutes in, so maybe... Closer to what we want. Maybe they'll be good in an average. German bakery. Or a slightly below average, because <laughs> the last one was bad, so it's got to go at least to below average. Yeah, yeah. It's an improvement for sure. I mean, I'm definitely starting to see more life in this dough. I've seen a fair amount of dough in the proofer. I can tell you that for me, aside from the fact that I don't know what a pretzel is supposed to feel like before it's baked, but if it's judging based on other products that we do bake, I would still proof this longer. But even in the last 45 minutes that we haven't been in here, I do see a meaningful change. I'm getting like a bounce back effect right now when I touch the dough. It's filling up with some gases. Some of the pretzels that I'm seeing here right now are like the same size as the ones that are six or seven minutes into the bake. So it seems like even in just the last 45 minutes, this stuff really started to go. And there's something about exponential growth that needs to be understood in this, uh, the way that the microbes work. Because if we leave a lot of room for the microbes to uh, have food, then they will continue to multiply. And as they multiply, there's now more microbes that are feeding and releasing the gases that actually cause the proofing to happen. So even though 30 or 40 minutes ago, it seemed like nothing was happening, it's not a linear path. It's this kind of a path. I think we're starting to actually see real proofing activity. I'm kind of curious to see what, what you think. It still takes more time. Yeah, yeah I agree. Sure. I'm now starting to see that they're bigger. Yep. You could probably say everything takes four to five times longer, without a doubt. But it's nice though, it gives you opportunity to, to play with time. I like that even. It's just about understanding the rhythm, really. Right. And as you said, it probably makes more sense to proof them after shaping already, before you retard them. Then you don't have to do the whole right. freezer process, because otherwise I think the freezer process becomes essential. You, you've got to develop the skin, yeah. and how are you going to do that fast? It would take you another two hours to refrigerate right. them, probably. Right. So I think we're doing what we have to be doing right now, but the next time I do these, you I save think that it'll step be, with the freezer, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, let's take a peek. Oh, yeah. That's the color, actually, you look for. Is this a first for the world, a pretzeled sourdough croissant? Yeah, that could be a first in the world, actually.
I think they almost beg for the salt, though. But the nice thing is you can put Nutella on them now. Uh, and many people yeah. love this. It's a contrast, you know, this light taste, not, not salty, and then Nutella. My kids actually love it. I mean, this is just a very, very cool thing. Yeah, this is nice. I think like you see that and you're like, what is that? Exactly. You kind of know what it is, but you don't know what it is. Yeah. Yeah. So that's 17 minutes. Warning. They're still on the light side. Some okay. people like it like that. I would probably bake it just a minute more. And we should definitely let them cure for 10, 15 minutes before we even break open. The crumb in the contrast of the outside is going to be beautiful. You can already imagine it here in the, on the edges. Yeah, it's like a prized possession, a pretzel croissant. So I got the spray bottle ready. You can one, put one here. Okay. That really brings out the pretzel flip smell. Yeah. I do think the second bake has a little bit more airiness and softness. The best is still yet to come. Okay, here we go. So I always give you three. By the time the third one is in the light, you can start pulling out the first one and uh, give it a little rinse. Yeah, they're soapy, right? Mm -hmm. I was thinking about that too. Okay. Substantially better, I would say. The taste com that comes from this lye, it just makes me smile. Mm. <laughs> I think they can stay a minute more. A minute more? May maybe turn them around. the ones in the front, I guess. Okay. 